Chapter Fourteen of the Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen. I return to Ireland, and exhibit my splendor and generosity in that kingdom. How were times changed with me now? I had left my country a poor, penniless boy a private soldier in a miserable marching regiment. I returned an accomplished man, with property to the amount of five thousand guineas in my possession, with a splendid wardrobe and jewel-case worth two thousand more, having mingled in all the scenes of life a not undistinguished actor in them, having shared in war and in love, having by my own genius and energy won my way from poverty and obscurity to competence and splendor. As I looked out from my chariot windows as it rolled along over the bleak bare roads, by the miserable cabins of the peasantry, who came out in their rags to stare as the splendid equipage passed, and huzzahed for his lordship's honor as they saw the magnificent stranger in the superb, gilded vehicle, my huge body-servant Fritz lolling behind with curling moustaches and long queue, his green livery barred with silver lace, I could not help thinking of myself with considerable complacency, and thanking my stars that had endowed me with so many good qualities. But for my own merits, I should have been a raw Irish squireen such as those I saw swaggering about the wretched towns through which my chariot passed on its road to Dublin. I might have married Nora Brady, and though, thank heaven, I did not, I have never thought of that girl but with kindness, and even remember the bitterness of losing her more clearly at this moment than any other incident of my life. I might have been the father of ten children by this time, or a farmer on my own account, or an agent to a squire, or a gauger, or an attorney. And here I was one of the most famous gentlemen of Europe. I bade my fellow get a bag of copper money and throw it among the crowd as we changed horses, and I warrant me there was as much shouting set up in praise of my honour as if my Lord Townsend, the Lord Lieutenant himself, had been passing. My second day's journey, for the Irish roads were rough in those days and the progress of a gentleman's chariot terribly slow, brought me to Carlow, where I put up at the very inn which I had used eleven years back when flying from home after the supposed murder of Quinn in the duel. How well I remember every moment of the scene. The old landlord was gone who had served me. The inn that I then thought so comfortable looked wretched and dismantled. But the claret was as good as in the old days, and I had the host to partake of a jug of it and hear the news of the country. He was as communicative as hosts usually are. The crops and the markets, the price of beasts at the last Castle Dermot Fair, the last story about the vicar, and the last joke of Father Hogan, the priest, how the white boys had burned down Squire Scanlon's ricks, and the highwaymen had been beaten off in their attack upon Sir Thomas's house, who was to hunt the Kilkenny hounds next season, and the wonderful run entirely they had last March what troops were in the town, and how Miss Biddy Toole had run off with Ensign Mullins, all the news of sport, assize, and quarter sessions, were detailed by this worthy chronicler of small beer, who wondered that my honour hadn't heard of them in England, or in foreign parts, where he seemed to think the world was as interested as he was about the doings of Kilkenny and Carlo. I listened to these tales with, I own, a considerable pleasure for every now and then a name would come up in the conversations which I remembered in old days, and bring with it a hundred associations connected with them. I had received many letters from my mother, who informed me of the doings of the Brady's town family. My uncle was dead, and Mick, his eldest son, had followed him too to the grave. The Brady girls had separated from their paternal roof as soon as their elder brother came to rule over it. Some were married, some had gone to settle with their odious old mother in out-of-the-way watering places. Ulick, though he had succeeded to the estate, had come in for a bankrupt property, 
and castle brady was now inhabited only by the bats and owls and the old gamekeeper my mother mrs harry berry had gone to live at bray to sit under mr jowls her favorite preacher who had a chapel there and finally the landlord told me that mrs berry's son had gone to foreign parts enlisted in the prussian service and had been shot there as a deserter i don't care to own that i hired a stout nag from the landlord's stable after dinner and rode back at nightfall twenty miles to my old home my heart beat to see it berryville had got a pestle and mortar over the door and was called the esculapian repository by dr mcshane a red-headed lad was spreading a plaster in the old parlor the little window of my room once so neat and bright was cracked in many places and stuffed with rags here and there the flowers had disappeared from the trim garden beds which my good orderly mother tended in the churchyard there were two more names put into the stone over the family vault of the bradys they were those of my cousin for whom my regard was small and my uncle whom i had always loved i asked my old companion the blacksmith who had beaten me so often in old days to give my horse a feed and a litter he was a worn weary-looking man now with a dozen dirty ragged children paddling about his smithy and had no recollection of the fine gentleman who stood before him i did not seek to recall myself to his memory till the next day when i put ten guineas into his hand and bade him drink the health of english redmond as for castle brady the gates of the park were still there but the old trees were cut down in the avenue a black stump jutting out here and there and casting long shadows as i passed in the moonlight over the worn grass-grown old road a few cows were at pasture there the garden gate was gone and the place a tangled wilderness i sat down on the old bench where i had sat on the day when nora jilted me and i do believe my feelings were as strong then as they had been when i was a boy eleven years before and i caught myself almost crying again to think that nora brady had deserted me i believe a man forgets nothing i've seen a flower or heard some trivial word or two which have awakened recollections that somehow had lain dormant for scores of years and when i entered the house in clarges street where i was born it was used as a gambling house when i first visited london all of a sudden the memory of my childhood came back to me of my actual infancy i recollected my father in green and gold holding me up to look at a gilt coach which stood at the door and my mother in a flowered sack with patches on her face some day i wonder will everything we have seen and thought and done come and flash across our minds in this way i had rather not i felt so as i sat upon the bench at castle brady and thought of the bygone times the hall door was open it was always so at that house the moon was flaring in at the long old windows and throwing ghastly checkers upon the floors and the stars were looking in on the other side in the blue of the yawning window over the great stair from it you could see the old stable clock with the letters glistening on it still there had been jolly horses in those stables once and i could see my uncle's honest face and hear him talking to his dogs as they came jumping and whining and barking round about him of a gay winter morning we used to mount there and the girls looked out at us from the hall window where i stood and looked at the sad mouldy lonely old place there was a red light shining through the crevices of a door at one corner of the building and a dog presently came out baying loudly and a limping man followed with a fowling piece who's there said the old man phil purcell don't you know me shouted i it's redmond barry i thought the old man would have fired his piece at me at first for he pointed it at the window 
but I called to him to hold his hand and came down and embraced him. Sha! I don't care to tell the rest. Phil and I had a long night, and talked over a thousand foolish old things that have no interest for any soul alive now. For what soul is there alive that cares for Barry Linden? I settled a hundred guineas on the old man when I got to Dublin, and made him an annuity which enabled him to pass his old days in comfort. Poor Phil Purcell was amusing himself at a game of exceedingly dirty cards with an old acquaintance of mine, no other than Tim, who was called my valet in the days of yore, and whom the reader may remember as clad in my father's old liveries. They used to hang about him in those times, and lap over his wrists and down to his heels. But Tim, though he protested he had nigh killed himself with grief when I went away, had managed to grow enormously fat in my absence, and would have fitted almost into Daniel Lambert's coat, or that of the vicar of Castle Brady, whom he served in the capacity of clerk. I would have engaged the fellow in my service, but for his momentous size, which rendered him quite unfit to be the attendant of any gentleman of condition. And so I presented him with a handsome gratuity, and promised to stand godfather to his next child, the eleventh since my absence. There is no country in the world where the work of multiplying is carried on so prosperously as in my native island. Mr. Tim had married the girl's waiting-maid, who had been a kind friend of mine in the early times, and I had to go salute poor Molly the next day, and found her a slatternly wench in a mud hut, surrounded by a brood of children almost as ragged as those of my friend the blacksmith. From Tim and Phil Purcell, thus met fortuitously together, I got the very last news respecting my family. My mother was well. Faith, sir, says Tim, and you've come in time, mayhap, for preventing an addition to your family. Sir, exclaimed I, in a fit of indignation, in the shape of father-in-law, I mean, sir. The mistress is going to take on with Mr. Jowls, the preacher. Poor Nora, he added, had made many additions to the illustrious race of Quinn, and my cousin Ulick was in Dublin, coming to little good, both my informants feared, and having managed to run through the small available remains of property which my good old uncle had left behind him. I saw I should have no small family to provide for. And then, to conclude the evening, Phil, Tim, and I had a bottle of Uskaba, the taste of which I had remembered for eleven good years, and did not part except with the warmest terms of fellowship, and until the sun had been some time in the sky. I am exceedingly affable. That has always been one of my characteristics. I have no false pride, as many men of high lineage like my own have, and, in default of better company, will hob and knob with a ploughboy or a private soldier just as readily as with the first noble in the land. I went back to the village in the morning, and found a pretext for visiting Berryville under a device of purchasing drugs. The hooks were still in the wall where my silver-hiked sword used to hang. A blister was lying on the window-sill where my mother's whole duty of man had its place, and the odious Dr. McShane had found out who I was. My countrymen find out everything, and a great deal more besides, and sniggering, asked me how I left the King of Prussia, and whether my friend the Emperor Joseph was as much liked as the Empress Maria Theresa had been. The bell-ringers would have had a ring of the bells for me, but there was but one, Tim, who was too fat to pull. And I rode off before the vicar, Dr. Bolter, who had succeeded old Mr. Texter, who had the living in my time, had time to come out to compliment me. But the rapscallions of the beggarly village had assembled in a dirty army to welcome me, and cheered, Hurrah for Master Redmond, as I rode away. My people were not a little anxious regarding me by the time I returned to Carlow, and the landlord was very much afraid, he said, that the highwaymen had gotten hold of me. There, too, my name and station had been learned from my servant Fritz, 
who had not spared his praises of his master, and had invented some magnificent histories concerning me. He said it was the truth that I was intimate with half the sovereigns of Europe, and the prime favorite with most of them. Indeed, I had made my uncle's order of the spur hereditary, and travelled under the name of the Chevalier Barry, Chamberlain to the Duke of Hohenzollern Siegmaringen. They gave me the best horses the stable possessed to carry me on my road to Dublin, and the strongest ropes for harness, and we got on pretty well, and there was no rencontre between the highwaymen and the pistols with which Fritz and I were provided. We lay that night at Kilcullen, and the next day I made my entry into the city of Dublin, with four horses to my carriage, five thousand guineas in my purse, and one of the most brilliant reputations in Europe, having quitted the city a beggarly boy eleven years before. The citizens of Dublin have as great and laudable a desire for knowing their neighbors' concerns as the country people have, and it is impossible for a gentleman, however modest his desires may be, and such mine have notoriously been through life, to enter the capital without having his name printed in every newspaper and mentioned in a number of societies. My name and titles were all over the town the day after my arrival. A great number of polite persons did me the honor to call at my lodgings, when I selected them. And this was a point very necessarily of immediate care, for the hotels in the town were but vulgar holes, unfit for a nobleman of my fashion and elegance. I had been informed of the fact by travellers on the continent, and, determining to fix on a lodging at once, I bade the drivers go slowly up and down the streets with my chariot, until I had selected a place suitable to my rank. This proceeding, and the uncouth questions and behaviour of my German, Fritz, who was instructed to make inquiries at the different houses until convenient apartments could be lighted upon, brought an immense mob round my coach, and by the time the rooms were chosen you might have supposed I was the new general of the forces, so great was the multitude following us. I fixed at length upon a handsome suite of apartments in Capel Street, paid the ragged postilions who had driven me a splendid gratuity, and establishing myself in the rooms, with my baggage and Fritz, desired the landlord to engage me a second fellow to wear my liveries, a couple of stout, reputable chairmen and their machine and a coachman who had handsome job-horses to hire for my chariot, and serviceable riding-horses to sell. I gave him a handsome sum in advance, and I promise you the effect of my advertisement was such that next day I had a regular levee in my antechamber. Grooms, valets, and maitres d'hôtel offered themselves without number. I had proposals for the purchase of horses sufficient to mount a regiment, both from dealers and gentlemen of the first fashion. Sir Lawler Galder came to propose to me the most elegant bay mare ever stepped. My lord Dundoodle had a team of four that wouldn't disgrace my friend the emperor, and the Marquess of Ballyragget sent his gentleman and his compliments, stating that if I would step up to his stables, or do him the honor of breakfasting with him previously, he would show me the two finest greys in Europe. I determined to accept the invitations of Dundoodle and Ballyragget, but to purchase my horses from the dealers. It is always the best way. Besides, in those days, in Ireland, if a gentleman warranted his horse and it was not sound, or a dispute arose, the remedy you had was the offer of a bullet in your waistcoat. I had played at the bullet game too much in earnest to make use of it heedlessly. And I may say, proudly for myself, that I never engaged in a duel unless I had a real, available, and prudent reason for it. There was a simplicity about this Irish gentry which amused and made me wonder. If they tell more fibs than their downright neighbors across the water, on the other hand they believe more. And I made myself in a single week such a reputation in Dublin as would take a man ten years and a mint of money to acquire in London. I had won five hundred thousand pounds at play. I was the favorite of the Empress Catherine of Russia, the confidential agent of Frederick of Prussia. It was I won the Battle of Hochkirchen. 
I was the cousin of Madame du Barry, the French king's favorite, and a thousand things beside. Indeed, to tell the truth, I hinted at a number of these stories to my kind friends Ballyragget and Gawler, and they were not slow to improve the hints I gave them. After having witnessed the splendors of civilized life abroad, the sight of Dublin in the year 1771, when I returned thither, struck me with anything but respect. It was as savage as Warsaw, almost, without the regal grandeur of the latter city. The people looked more ragged than any race I have ever seen, except the gypsy hordes along the banks of the Danube. There was, as I have said, not an inn in the town fit for a gentleman of condition to dwell in. Those luckless fellows who could not keep a carriage, and walked the streets at night, ran imminent risks of the knives of the women and ruffians who lay in wait there, of a set of ragged, savage villains, who neither knew the use of shoe nor razor. And as a gentleman entered his chair or his chariot to be carried to the evening rout or the play, the flambeau of the footman would light up such a set of wild, gibbering, Milesian faces as would frighten a genteel person of average nerves. I was luckily endowed with strong ones. Besides, I had seen my amiable countrymen before. I know this description of them will excite anger among some Irish patriots, who don't like to have the nakedness of our land abused, and are angry if the whole truth be told concerning it. But, bah, it was a poor provincial place, Dublin, in the old days of which I speak, and many a tenth-rate German residency is more genteel. There were, it is true, near three hundred resident peers at the period, and a house of commons, and my lord mayor and his corporation, and a roistering, noisy university, whereof the students made no small disturbances nightly, patronized the roundhouse, ducked obnoxious printers and tradesmen, and gave the law at the Crow Street Theatre. But I had seen too much of the first society of Europe to be much tempted by the society of these noisy gentry, and was a little too much of a gentleman to mingle with the disputes and politics of my Lord Mayor and his aldermen. In the House of Commons there were some dozen of right pleasant fellows. I never heard in the English Parliament better speeches than from Flood and Daly of Galway, Dick Sheridan, though not a well-bred person, was as amusing and ingenious a table companion as ever I met, and though during Mr. Edmund Burke's interminable speeches in the English house I used always to go to sleep, I yet have heard from well-informed parties that Mr. Burke was a person of considerable abilities, and even reputed to be eloquent in his more favorable moments. I soon began to enjoy to the full extent the pleasures that the wretched place affords, and which were within a gentleman's reach, Ranala and the Redato, Mr. Mossop at Crow Street, my Lord Lieutenant's parties, where there was a great deal too much boozing and too little play to suit a person of my elegant and refined habits. Daly's Coffee House and the houses of the nobility were soon open to me, and I remarked with astonishment in the higher circles what I had experienced in the lower on my first unhappy visit to Dublin, an extraordinary want of money, and a preposterous deal of promissory notes flying about, for which I was quite unwilling to stake my guineas. The ladies, too, were mad for play, but exceeding unwilling to pay when they lost. Thus, when the old Countess of Trumpington lost ten pieces to me at quadrille, she gave me, instead of money, her ladyship's note of hand on her agent in Galway, which I put, with a great deal of politeness, into the candle. But when the countess made me a second proposition to play, I said that as soon as her ladyship's remittances were arrived, I would be the readiest person to meet her, but till then was her very humble servant. And I maintained this resolution and singular character throughout the Dublin society giving out at dailies that I was ready to play any man for any sum at any game, or to fence with him or ride with him, regard being had to our weight, or to shoot flying or at a mark, and in this latter accomplishment, especially if the mark be a live one, Irish gentlemen of that day had no ordinary skill. 
of course i dispatched a courier in my liveries to castle linden with a private letter for runt demanding from him full particulars of the countess of linden's state of health and mind and a touching and eloquent letter to her ladyship in which i bade her remember ancient days which i tied up with a single hair from the lock which i had purchased from her woman and in which i told her that sylvander remembered his oath and could never forget his callista the answer i received from her was exceedingly unsatisfactory and inexplicit that from mr runt explicit enough but not at all pleasant in its contents my lord george poynings the marquis of tiptoft's younger son was paying very marked addresses to the widow being a kinsman of the family and having been called to ireland relative to the will of the deceased sir charles linden now there was a sort of rough and ready law in ireland in those days which was of great convenience to persons desirous of expeditious justice and of which the newspapers of the time contain a hundred proofs fellows with the nicknames of captain fireball lieutenant buffcoat and ensign steel were repeatedly sending warning letters to landlords and murdering them if the notes were unattended to the celebrated captain thunder ruled in the southern counties and his business seemed to be to procure wives for gentlemen who had not sufficient means to please the parents of the young ladies or perhaps had not time for a long and intricate courtship i had found my cousin ulick at dublin grown very fat and very poor hunted up by jews and creditors dwelling in all sorts of queer corners from which he issued at nightfall to the castle or to his card party at his tavern but he was always the courageous fellow and i hinted to him the state of my affections regarding lady linden the countess of linden said the poor ulick well that is a wonder i myself have been mightily sweet upon a young lady one of the killjoys of ballyhack who has ten thousand pounds to her fortune and to whom her ladyship is a guardian but how is a poor fellow without a coat to his back to get on with an heiress in such company as that i might as well propose for the countess myself you'd better not said i laughing the man who tries runs a chance of going out of the world first and i explained to him my own intention regarding lady linden honest ulick whose respect for me was prodigious when he saw how splendid my appearance was and heard how wonderful my adventures and great my experience of fashionable life had been was lost in admiration of my daring and energy when i confided to him my intention of marrying the greatest heiress in england i bade ulick go out of town on any pretext he chose and put a letter into a post-office near castle linden which i prepared in a feigned hand and in which i gave a solemn warning to lord george poynings to quit the country saying that the great prize was never meant for the likes of him and that there were heiresses enough in england without coming to rob them out of the domains of captain fireball the letter was written on a dirty piece of paper in the worst spelling it came to my lord by the post conveyance and being a high-spirited young man he of course laughed at it as ill luck would have it for him he appeared in dublin a very short time afterwards was introduced to the chevalier redmond barry at the lord lieutenant's table adjourned with him and several other gentlemen to the club at daly's and there in a dispute about the pedigree of a horse in which everybody said i was in the right words arose and a meeting was the consequence i had had no affair in dublin since my arrival and people were anxious to see whether i was equal to my reputation i make no boast about these matters but always do them when the time comes and poor lord george who had a neat hand and a quick eye enough but was bred in the clumsy english school only stood before my point until i had determined where i should hit him my sword went in under his guard and came out at his back when he fell he good-naturedly extended his hand to me and said mr barry i was wrong 
I felt not very well at ease when the poor fellow made this confession, for the dispute had been of my making, and, to tell the truth, I had never intended it should end in any other way than a meeting. He lay on his bed for four months with the effects of that wound, and the same post which conveyed to Lady Lyndon the news of the duel carried her a message from Captain Fireball to say, This is number one. You, Ulick, said I, shall be number two. Faith, said my cousin, one's enough. But I had my plan regarding him, and determined at once to benefit this honest fellow, and to forward my own designs upon the widow. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of the Memoirs of Barry Lyndon, Esquire, by William Makepeace Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen. I pay court to my Lady Lyndon. As my uncle's attainder was not reversed for being out with the pretender in 1745, it would have been inconvenient for him to accompany his nephew to the land of our ancestors, where if not hanging, at least a tedious process of imprisonment and a doubtful pardon would have awaited the good old gentleman. In any important crisis of my life his advice was always of advantage to me, and I did not fail to seek it at this juncture and to implore his counsel as regarded my pursuit of the widow. I told him of the situation of her heart, as I have described it in the last chapter, of the progress that young Poynings had made in her affections, and of her forgetfulness of her old admirer. And I got a letter, in reply, full of excellent suggestions, by which I did not fail to profit. The kind Chevalier prefaced it by saying that he was for the present boarding in the Minorite convent at Brussels, that he had thoughts of making his salut there, and retiring forever from the world devoting himself to the severest practices of religion. Meanwhile he wrote with regard to the lovely widow. It was natural that a person of her vast wealth and not disagreeable person should have many adorers about her, and that, as in her husband's lifetime she had shown herself not at all disinclined to receive my addresses, I must make no manner of doubt I was not the first person whom she had so favoured nor was I likely to be the last. I would, my dear child, he added, that the ugly attainder round my neck, and the resolution I have formed of retiring from a world of sin and vanity altogether, did not prevent me from coming personally to your aid in this delicate crisis of your affairs. For to lead them to a good end, it requires not only the indomitable courage, swagger, and audacity which you possess beyond any young man I have ever known, as for the swagger as the chevalier calls it, I deny it in toto, being always the most modest in my demeanour. But though you have the vigour to execute, you have not the ingenuity to suggest plans of conduct for the following out of a scheme that is likely to be long and difficult of execution. Would you have ever thought of the brilliant scheme of the Countess Ida, which so nearly made you the greatest fortune in Europe? but for the advice and experience of a poor old man, now making up his accounts with the world and about to retire from it for good and all. Well, with regard to the Countess of Linden, your manner of winning her is quite en l'air at present to me. Nor can I advise day by day as I would, according to circumstances as they arise. But your general scheme should be this. If I remember the letters you used to have from her during the period of the correspondence which the silly woman entertained you with, much high-flown sentiments passed between you, and especially was written by her ladyship herself. She is a blue-stocking and fond of writing. She used to make her griefs with her husband the continual theme of her correspondence, as women will do. I recollect several passages in her letters bitterly deploring her fate in being united to one so unworthy of her. Surely in the mass of B.A. you possess from her there must be enough to compromise her. 
look them well over, select passages, and threaten to do so. Write to her at first in the undoubting tone of a lover who has every claim upon her. Then, if she is silent, remonstrate, alluding to former promises from her, producing proofs of her former regard for you, vowing despair, destruction, revenge, if she prove unfaithful. Frighten her, astonish her by some daring feat which will let her see your indomitable resolution. You are the man to do it. Your sword has a reputation in Europe, and you have a character for boldness, which was the first thing that caused my Lady Linden to turn her eyes upon you. Make the people talk about you at Dublin. Be as splendid and as brave and as odd as possible. How I wish I were near you. You have no imagination to invent such a character as I would make for you. But why speak? Have I not had enough of the world and its vanities? There was much practical good sense in this advice, which I quote, unaccompanied with the lengthened description of his mortifications and devotions, which my uncle indulged in, finishing his letter as usual with earnest prayers for my conversion to the true faith. But he was constant to his form of worship, and I, as a man of honor and principle, was resolute to mine, and have no doubt that the one, in this respect, will be as acceptable as the other. Under these directions it was, then, that I wrote to Lady Linden, to ask on my arrival when the most respectful of her admirers might be permitted to intrude upon her grief. Then, as her ladyship was silent, I demanded, had she forgotten old times, and one whom she had favoured with her intimacy at a very happy period? Had Callista forgotten Eugenio? At the same time I sent down by my servant with this letter a present of a little sword for Lord Bullingdon, and a private note to his governor, whose note of hand, by the way, I possessed for a sum, I forget what, but such as the poor fellow would have been very unwilling to pay. To this an answer came from her ladyship's amanuensis, stating that Lady Linden was too much disturbed by grief at her recent dreadful calamity to see any one but her own relations. And advices from my friend, the boy's governor, stating that my lord George Poynings was the young kinsman who was about to console her. This caused the quarrel between me and the young nobleman, whom I took care to challenge on his first arrival at Dublin. When the news of the duel was brought to the widow at Castle Linden, my informant wrote me that Lady Linden shrieked and flung down the journal and said, The horrible monster! He would not shrink from murder, I believe. And little Lord Bullingdon, drawing his sword, the sword I had given him, the rascal, declared he would kill with it the man who had hurt Cousin George. On Mr. Runt telling him that I was the donor of the weapon, the little rogue still vowed that he would kill me all the same. Indeed, in spite of my kindness to him, that boy always seemed to detest me. Her ladyship sent up daily couriers to inquire after the health of Lord George, and thinking to myself that she would probably be induced to come to Dublin if she were to hear that he was in danger, I managed to have her informed that he was in a precarious state, that he grew worse, that Redmond Barry had fled in consequence. Of this flight I caused the Mercury newspaper to give notice also, but indeed it did not carry me beyond the town of Bray, where my poor mother dwelt, and where, under the difficulties of a duel, I might be sure of having a welcome. Those readers who have the sentiment of filial duty strong in their mind will wonder that I have not yet described my interview with that kind mother whose sacrifices for me in youth had been so considerable, and for whom a man of my warm and affectionate nature could not but feel the most enduring and sincere regard. But a man, moving in the exalted sphere of society in which I now stood, has his public duties to perform before he consults his private affections. And so upon my first arrival I dispatched a messenger to Mrs. Berry, 
stating my arrival, conveying to her my sentiments of respect and duty, and promising to pay them to her personally as soon as my business in Dublin would leave me free. This, I need not say, was very considerable. I had my horses to buy, my establishment to arrange, my entree into the genteel world to make. And having announced my intention to purchase horses and live in a genteel style, was in a couple of days so pestered by visits of the nobility and gentry, and so hampered by invitations to dinners and suppers, that it became exceedingly difficult for me during some days to manage my anxiously desired visit to Mrs. Barry. It appears that the good soul provided an entertainment as soon as she heard of my arrival, and invited all her humble acquaintances of Bray to be present, but I was engaged subsequently to my lord Ballyragget on the day appointed, and was of course obliged to break the promise I had made to Mrs. Barry to attend her humble festival. I endeavoured to sweeten the disappointment by sending my mother a handsome satin sack and a velvet robe, which I purchased for her at the best mercers in Dublin, and indeed told her I had brought from Paris expressly for her, but the messenger whom I dispatched with the presents brought back the parcels, with the piece of satin torn halfway up the middle, and I did not need his descriptions to be aware that something had offended the good lady, who came out, he said, and abused him at the door, and would have boxed his ears but that she was restrained by a gentleman in black, who, I concluded, with justice, was her clerical friend, Mr. Jowls. The reception of my presence made me rather dread than hope for an interview with Mrs. Barry, and delayed my visit to her for some days further. I wrote her a dutiful and soothing letter, to which there was no answer returned, although I mentioned that on my way to the capital I had been at Berryville, and revisited the old haunts of my youth. I don't care to own that she is the only human being whom I am afraid to face. I can recollect her fits of anger as a child and the reconciliations, which used to be still more violent and painful. And so, instead of going myself, I sent my factotum, Ulick Brady, to her, who rode back, saying that he had met with a reception he would not again undergo for twenty guineas, that he had been dismissed the house with strict injunctions to inform me that my mother disowned me forever. This parental anathema, as it were, affected me much, for I was always the most dutiful of sons, and I determined to go as soon as possible, and brave what I knew must be an inevitable scene of reproach and anger, for the sake, as I hoped, of as certain a reconciliation. I had been giving one night an entertainment to some of the genteelest company in Dublin, and was showing my lord Marquis downstairs with a pair of wax tapers, when I found a woman in a grey coat seated at my doorsteps, and to whom, taking her for a beggar, I tendered a piece of money, and whom my noble friends, who were rather hot with wine, began to joke, as my door closed and I bade them all good night. I was rather surprised and affected to find afterwards that the hooded woman was no other than my mother, whose pride had made her vow that she would not enter my doors but whose natural maternal yearnings had made her long to see her son's face once again, and who had thus planted herself in disguise at my gate. Indeed, I have found in my experience that these are the only women who will never deceive a man, and whose affection remains constant through all trials. Think of the hours that the kind soul must have passed, lonely in the street, listening to the din and merriment within my apartments the clinking of the glasses, the laughing, the choruses, and the cheering. When my affair with Lord George happened, and it became necessary to me, for the reasons I have stated, to be out of the way, now, thought I, is the time to make my peace with my good mother. She will never refuse me an asylum now that I am in distress. So sending to her a notice that I was coming, that I had had a duel which had brought me into trouble, and required I should go into hiding, I followed my messenger half an hour afterwards, and I warrant me there was no want of a good reception, for presently, 
being introduced into an empty room by the barefooted maid who waited upon mrs berry the door was opened and the poor mother flung herself into my arms with a scream and with transports of joy which i shall not attempt to describe they are but to be comprehended by women who have held in their arms an only child after a twelve years absence from him the rev mr jowls my mother's director was the only person to whom the door of her habitation was opened during my sojourn and he would take no denial he mixed for himself a glass of rum punch which he seemed in the habit of drinking at my good mother's charge groaned aloud and forthwith began reading me a lecture upon the sinfulness of my past courses and especially of the last horrible action i had been committing sinful said my mother bristling up when her son was attacked sure we're all sinners and it's you mr jowls who have given me the inexpressible blessing to let me know that but how else would you have the poor child behave i would have had the gentleman avoid the drink and the quarrel and this wicked duel altogether answered the clergyman but my mother cut him short by saying such sort of conduct might be very well in a person of his cloth and his birth but it neither became a brady nor a berry in fact she was quite delighted with the thought that i had pinked an english marquis's son in a duel and so to console her i told her of a score more in which i had been engaged and of some of which i have already informed the reader as my late antagonist was in no sort of danger when i spread that report of his perilous situation there was no particular call that my hiding should be very close but the widow did not know the fact as well as i did and caused her house to be barricaded and becky her barefooted serving wench to be a perpetual sentinel to give alarm lest the officers should be in search of me the only person i expected however was my cousin ulick who was to bring me the welcome intelligence of lady linden's arrival and i own after two days close confinement at bray in which i narrated all the adventures of my life to my mother and succeeded in making her accept the dresses she had formerly refused and a considerable addition to her income which i was glad to make i was very glad when i saw that reprobate ulick brady as my mother called him ride up to the door in my carriage with the welcome intelligence for my mother that the young lord was out of danger and for me that the countess of linden had arrived in dublin and i wish redmond that the young gentleman had been in danger a little longer said the widow her eyes filling with tears and you'd have stayed so much the more with your poor old mother but i dried her tears embracing her warmly and promised to see her often and hinted i would have mayhap a house of my own and a noble daughter to welcome her who is she redmond dear said the old lady one of the noblest and richest women in the empire mother answered i no mere brady this time i added laughing with which hopes i left mrs berry in the best of tempers no man can bear less malice than i do and when i have once carried my point i am one of the most placable creatures in the world i was a week in dublin before i thought it necessary to quit that capital I had become quite reconciled to my rival in that time, made a point of calling at his lodgings, and speedily became an intimate consoler of his bedside. He had a gentleman to whom I did not neglect to be civil, and towards whom I ordered my people to be particular in their attentions, for I was naturally anxious to learn what my lord George's position with the lady of Castle Linden had really been, whether other suitors were about the widow and how she would bear the news of his wound the young nobleman himself enlightened me somewhat upon the subjects i was most desirous to inquire into chevalier said he to me one morning when i went to pay him my compliments i find you are an old acquaintance with my kinswoman the countess of linden she writes me a page of abuse of you in a letter here and the strange part of the story is this that one day when there was talk about you at castle linden and the splendid equipage you were exhibiting in dublin 
the fair widow vowed and protested that she never had heard of you oh yes mamma said the little bullingdon the tall dark man at spa with the cast in his eye who used to make my governor tipsy and sent me the sword his name is mr berry but my lady ordered the boy out of the room and persisted in knowing nothing about you and are you a kinsman and acquaintance of my lady linden my lord said i in a tone of grave surprise yes indeed answered the young gentleman i left her house but to get this ugly wound from you and it came at a most unlucky time too why more unlucky now than at another moment why look you chevalier i think the widow was not unpartial to me i think i might have induced her to make our connection a little closer and faith though she is older than i am she is the richest party now in england my lord george said i will you let me ask you a frank but an odd question will you show me her letters indeed i'll do no such thing replied he in a rage nay don't be angry if i show you letters of lady linden's to me will you let me see hers to you what in heaven's name do you mean mr barry said the young gentleman i mean that i passionately loved lady linden i mean that i'm a that i rather was not indifferent to her i i mean that i love her to distraction at this present moment and will die myself or kill the man who possesses her before me you marry the greatest heiress and the noblest blood in england said lord george haughtily there's no nobler blood in europe than mine answered i and i tell you i don't know whether to hope or not but this i know that there were days in which poor as i am the great heiress did not disdain to look down upon my poverty and that any man who marries her passes over my dead body to do it it's lucky for you i added gloomily that on the occasion of my engagement with you i did not know what were your views regarding my lady linden my poor boy you are a lad of courage and i love you mine is the first sword in europe and you would have been lying in a narrower bed than you now occupy boy said lord george i am not four years younger than you are you are forty years younger than i am in experience i have passed through every grade of life with my own skill and daring i have made my own fortune i have been in fourteen pitched battles as a private soldier and have been twenty-three times on the ground and never was touched but once and that was by the sword of a french maitre d'armes whom i killed i started in life at seventeen a beggar and am now at seven-and-twenty with twenty thousand guineas do you suppose a man of my courage and energy can't attain anything that he dares and that having claims upon the widow i will not press them this speech was not exactly true to the letter for i had multiplied my pitched battles my duels and my wealth somewhat but i saw that it made the impression i desired to effect upon the young gentleman's mind who listened to my statement with peculiar seriousness and whom i presently left to digest it a couple of days afterwards i called to see him again when i brought with me some of the letters that had passed between me and my lady linden here said i look i show it you in confidence it is a lock of her ladyship's hair here are her letters signed callista and addressed to eugenio here is a poem when saul bedecks the mead with light and pallid cynthia sheds her ray addressed by her ladyship to your humble servant callista eugenio saul bedecks the mead with light cried the young lord am i dreaming why my dear berry the widow has sent me the very poem herself rejoicing in the sunshine bright or musing in the evening gray i could not help laughing as he made the quotation they were in fact the very words my callista had addressed to me and we found upon comparing letters that whole passages of eloquence figured in the one correspondence which appeared in the other see what it is to be a blue stocking and have a love of letter writing the young man put down the letters in great perturbation 
well thank heaven said he after a pause of some duration thank heaven for a good riddance ah mr berry what a woman i might have married had these lucky papers not come in my way i thought my lady linden had a heart sir i must confess though not a very warm one and that at least one could trust her but marry her now i would as lief send my servant into the street to get me a wife as put up with such an ephesian matron as that my lord george said i you little know the world remember what a bad husband lady linden had and don't be astonished that she on her side should be indifferent nor has she i will dare to wager ever passed beyond the bounds of harmless gallantry or sinned beyond the composing of a sonnet or a billet doux my wife said the little lord shall write no sonnets or billet doux and i am heartily glad to think i have obtained in good time a knowledge of the heartless vixen with whom i thought myself for a moment in love the wounded young nobleman was either as i have said very young and green in matters of the world for to suppose that a man would give up forty thousand a year because forsooth the lady connected with it had written a few sentimental letters to a young fellow is too absurd or as i am inclined to believe he was glad of an excuse to quit the field altogether being by no means anxious to meet the victorious sword of redmond barry a second time when the idea of poining's danger or the reproaches probably addressed by him to the widow regarding myself had brought this exceedingly weak and feeble woman up to dublin as i expected and my worthy ulick had informed me of her arrival i quitted my good mother who was quite reconciled to me indeed the duel had done that and found the disconsolate callista was in the habit of paying visits to the wounded swain much to the annoyance the servants told me of that gentleman the english are often absurdly high and haughty upon a point of punctilio and after his kinswoman's conduct lord poynings swore he would have no more to do with her i had this information from his lordship's gentleman with whom as i have said i took particular care to be friends nor was i denied admission by his porter when i chose to call as before her ladyship had most likely bribed that person as i had for she had found her way up though denied admission and in fact i had watched her from her own house to lord george poyning's lodgings and seen her descend from her chair there and enter before i myself followed her i proposed to await her quietly in the anteroom to make a scene there and reproach her with infidelity if necessary but matters were as it happened arranged much more conveniently for me and walking unannounced into the outer room of his lordship's apartments i had the felicity of hearing in the next chamber of which the door was partially open the voice of my callista she was in full cry appealing to the poor patient as he lay confined in his bed and speaking in the most passionate manner what can lead you george she said to doubt of my faith how can you break my heart by casting me off in this monstrous manner do you wish to drive your poor callista to the grave well well i shall join there the dear departed angel who entered it three months since said lord george with a sneer it's a wonder you have survived so long don't treat your poor callista in this cruel cruel manner antonio cried the widow bah said lord george my wound is bad my doctors forbid me much talk suppose your antonio tired my dear can't you console yourself with somebody else heavens lord george antonio console yourself with eugenio said the young nobleman bitterly and began ringing his bell on which his valet who was in an inner room came out and he bade him show her ladyship downstairs lady linden issued from the room in the greatest flurry she was dressed in deep weeds with a veil over her face and did not recognize the person waiting in the outer apartment as she went down the stairs i stepped lightly after her and as her chairman opened her door sprang forward and took her hand to place her in the vehicle 
dearest widow said i his lordship spoke correctly console yourself with eugenio she was too frightened even to scream as her chairman carried her away she was set down at her house and you may be sure that i was at the chair door as before to help her out monstrous man said she i desire you to leave me madam it would be against my oath replied i recollect the vow eugenio sent to callista if you do not quit me i will call for the domestics to turn you from the door what when i am come with my callista's letters in my pocket to return them mayhap you can soothe madam but you cannot frighten redmond barry what is it you would have of me sir said the widow rather agitated let me come upstairs and i will tell you all i replied and she condescended to give me her hand and to permit me to lead her from her chair to her drawing-room when we were alone i opened my mind honourably to her dearest madam said i do not let your cruelty drive a desperate slave to fatal measures i adore you in former days you allowed me to whisper my passion to you unrestrained at present you drive me from your door leave my letters unanswered and prefer another to me my flesh and blood cannot bear such treatment look upon the punishment i have been obliged to inflict tremble at that which i may be compelled to administer to that unfortunate young man so sure as he marries you madam he dies i do not recognize said the widow the least right you have to give the law to the countess of linden i do not in the least understand your threats or heed them what has passed between me and an irish adventurer that should authorize this impertinent intrusion these have passed madam said i callista's letters to eugenio well, they may have been very innocent but will the world believe it you may have only intended to play with the heart of the poor artless irish gentleman who adored and confided in you but who will believe the stories of your innocence against the irrefragable testimony of your own handwriting who will believe that you could write these letters in the mere wantonness of coquetry and not under the influence of affection villain cried my lady linden could you dare to construe out of those idle letters of mine any other meaning than that which they really bear i will construe anything out of them said i such is the passion which animates me towards you i have sworn it you must and shall be mine did you ever know me to promise to accomplish a thing and fail which will you prefer to have from me a love such as woman never knew from man before or a hatred to which there exists no parallel a woman of my rank sir can fear nothing from the hatred of an adventurer like yourself replied the lady drawing up stately look at your poinings was he of your rank you are the cause of that young man's wound madam and but that the instrument of your savage cruelty relented would have been the author of his murder yes of his murder for if a wife is faithless does not she arm the husband who punishes the seducer and i look upon you honoria linden as my wife husband wife sir cried the widow quite astonished yes wife husband i'm not one of those poor souls with whom coquettes can play and who may afterwards throw them aside you would forget what passed between us at spa callista would forget eugenio but i will not let you forget me you thought to trifle with my heart did you when once moved honoria it is moved forever i love you love as passionately now as i did when my passion was hopeless and now that i can win you do you think i will forego you cruel cruel callista you little know the power of your own charms if you think their effect is so easily obliterated you little know the constancy of this pure and noble heart if you think that having once loved it can ever cease to adore you no i swear by your cruelty that i will revenge it 
by your wonderful beauty that i will win it and be worthy to win it lovely fascinating fickle cruel woman you shall be mine i swear it your wealth may be great but am i not of a generous nature enough to use it worthily your rank is lofty but not so lofty as my ambition you threw yourself away once on a cold and spiritless debauchee give yourself now honoria to a man and one who however lofty your rank may be will enhance and become it as i poured words to this effect out on the astonished widow i stood over her and fascinated her with the glance of my eye saw her turn red and pale with fear and wonder saw that my praise of her charms and the exposition of my passion were not unwelcome to her and witnessed with triumphant composure the mastery i was gaining over her terror be sure of that is not a bad ingredient of love a man who wills fiercely to win the heart of a weak and vaporish woman must succeed if he have opportunity enough terrible man said lady linden shrinking from me as soon as i had done speaking indeed i was at a loss for words and thinking of another speech to make to her terrible man leave me i saw that i had made an impression on her from those very words if she lets me into the house to-morrow said i she is mine as i went downstairs i put ten guineas into the hand of the hall porter who looked quite astonished at such a gift it is to repay you for the trouble of opening the door to me said i you will have to do so often end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the memoirs of barry linden esq by william makepeace thackeray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen i provide nobly for my family the next day when i went back my fears were realized the door was refused to me my lady was not at home this i knew to be false i had watched the door the whole morning from a lodging i took at a house opposite your lady is not out said i she has denied me and i can't of course force my way to her but listen you are an englishman that i am said the fellow with an air of the utmost superiority your honour could tell that by my accent listen then said i your lady's letters pass through your hands don't they a crown for every one that you bring me to read there's a whisky shop in the next street bring them there when you go to drink and call for me by the name of dermot i recollect your honour at spar says the fellow grinning seven's the main hey and being exceedingly proud of this reminiscence i bade my inferior adieu i do not defend this practice of letter-opening in private life except in cases of the most urgent necessity when we must follow the examples of our betters the statesmen of all europe and for the sake of a great good infringe a little matter of ceremony my lady linden's letters were none the worse for being opened and a great deal the better the knowledge obtained from the perusal of some of her multifarious epistles enabling me to become intimate with her character in a hundred ways and obtain a power over her by which i was not slow to profit by the aid of the letters and of my english friend whom i always regaled with the best of liquor and satisfied with presents of money still more agreeable i used to put on a livery in order to meet him and a red wig in which it was impossible to know the dashing and elegant redmond barry i got such an insight into the widow's movements as astonished her i knew beforehand to which public places she would go they were on account of her widowhood but few and wherever she appeared at church or in the park i was always ready to offer her her book or canter on horseback by the side of her chariot 
Many of her ladyship's letters were the most whimsical rodomontades that ever blue stocking penned. She was a woman who took up and threw off a greater number of dear friends than anyone I ever knew. To some of these female darlings she began presently to write about my unworthy self, and it was with a sentiment of extreme satisfaction I found at length that the widow was growing dreadfully afraid of me, calling me her bête noire, her dark spirit, her murderous adorer, and a thousand other names indicative of her extreme disquietude and terror. It was, the wretch has been dogging my chariot through the park, or my fate pursued me at church, and my inevitable adorer handed me out of my chair at the mercer's, or what not. My wish was to increase this sentiment of awe in her bosom, and to make her believe that I was a person from whom escape was impossible. To this end, I bribed a fortune-teller whom she consulted along with a number of the most foolish and distinguished people of Dublin in those days, and who, although she went dressed like one of her waiting-women, did not fail to recognize her real rank, and to describe as her future husband her persevering adorer, Redmond Berry, Esquire. This incident disturbed her very much. She wrote about it in terms of great wonder and terror to her female correspondents. Can this monster, she wrote, indeed do as he boasts, and bend even fate to his will? Can he make me marry him, though I cordially detest him, and bring me a slave to his feet? The horrid look of his black serpent-like eyes fascinates and frightens me. It seems to follow me everywhere and even when I close my own eyes, the dreadful gaze penetrates the lids and is still upon me. When a woman begins to talk of a man in this way, he is an ass who does not win her. And for my part, I used to follow her about and put myself in an attitude opposite her and fascinate her with my glance, as she said, most assiduously. Lord George Poynings, her former admirer, was meanwhile keeping his room with his wound, and seemed determined to give up all claims to her favor, for he denied her admittance when she called, sent no answer to her multiplied correspondence, and contented himself by saying generally that the surgeon had forbidden him to receive visitors or to answer letters. Thus, while he went into the background, I came forward, and took care that no other rivals should present themselves with any chance of success for as soon as I heard of one, I had a quarrel fastened on him, and in this way pinked two more, besides my first victim, Lord George. I always took another pretext for quarrelling with them than the real one of attention to Lady Linden, so that no scandal or hurt to her ladyship's feelings might arise in consequence. But she very well knew what was the meaning of these duels, and the young fellows of Dublin, too, by laying two and two together, began to perceive that there was a certain dragon in watch for the wealthy heiress, and that the dragon must be subdued first, before they could get at the lady. I warrant that, after the first three, not many champions were found to address the lady, and have often laughed, in my sleeve, to see many of the young Dublin beaux riding by the side of her carriage scamper off as soon as my bay mare and green liveries made their appearance. I wanted to impress her with some great and awful instance of my power, and to this end had determined to confer a great benefit upon my honest cousin Ulick, and carry off for him the fair object of his affections, Miss Kiljoy, under the very eyes of her guardian and friend, Lady Linden, and in the teeth of the squires, the young lady's brothers, who passed the season at Dublin, and made as much swagger and to-do about their sister's ten thousand pounds Irish as if she had a plum to her fortune. The girl was by no means averse to Mr. Brady, and it only shows how faint-spirited some men are, and how a superior genius can instantly overcome difficulties which to common minds seem insuperable, that he never had the thought of running off with her, as I at once, and boldly, did. Miss Kiljoy had been a ward in Chancery until she attained her majority, 
before which period it would have been a dangerous matter for me to put in execution the scheme I meditated concerning her. But, though now free to marry whom she liked, she was a young lady of timid disposition, and as much under fear of her brothers and relatives as though she had not been independent of them. They had some friend of their own in view for the young lady, and had scornfully rejected the proposal of Ulick Brady, the ruined gentleman, who was quite unworthy, as these rustic bucks thought, of the hand of such a prodigiously wealthy heiress as their sister. Finding herself lonely in her great house in Dublin, the Countess of Linden invited her friend Miss Amelia to pass the season with her at Dublin, and, in a fit of maternal fondness, also sent for her son, the little Bullingdon, and my old acquaintance his governor, to come to the capital and bear her company. A family coach brought the boy, the heiress, and the tutor from Castle Linden, and I determined to take the first opportunity of putting my plan in execution. For this chance I had not very long to wait. I have said in a former chapter of my biography that the kingdom of Ireland was at this period ravaged by various parties of banditti, who, under the name of white boys, oak boys, steel boys, with captains at their head, killed proctors, fired stacks, hawked and maimed cattle, and took the law into their own hands. One of these bands, or several of them for what I know, was commanded by a mysterious personage called Captain Thunder, whose business seemed to be that of marrying people with or without their own consent, or that of their parents. The Dublin Gazettes and Mercuries of that period, the year 1772, teem with proclamations from the Lord Lieutenant, offering rewards for the apprehension of this dreadful Captain Thunder and his gang, and describing at length the various exploits of the savage aide-de-camp of Hymen. I determined to make use, if not of the services, at any rate of the name of Captain Thunder, and put my cousin Ulick in possession of his lady and her ten thousand pounds. She was no great beauty, and I presume it was the money he loved, rather than the owner of it. On account of her widowhood, Lady Linden could not as yet frequent the balls and routs which the hospitable nobility of Dublin were in the custom of giving but her friend Miss Kiljoy had no such cause for retirement, and was glad to attend any parties to which she might be invited. I made Ulick Brady a present of a couple of handsome suits of velvet, and by my influence procured him an invitation to many of the most elegant of these assemblies. But he had not my advantages or experience of the manners of court, was as shy with ladies as a young colt, and could no more dance a minuet than a donkey. He made very little way in the polite world or in his mistress's heart. In fact, I could see that she preferred several other young gentlemen to him, who were more at home in the ballroom than poor Ulick. He had made his first impression upon the heiress, and felt his first flame for her, in her father's house of Ballykiljoy, where he used to hunt and get drunk with the old gentleman. I could do them two well enough, anyhow, Ulick would say, heaving a sigh. And if it's drinking or riding across country would do it, there's no man in Ireland would have a better chance with Amelia. Never fear, Ulick, was my reply. You shall have your Amelia, or my name is not Redmond Barry. My lord Charlemont, who was one of the most elegant and accomplished noblemen in Ireland in those days, a fine scholar and wit, a gentleman who had travelled much abroad, where I had the honour of knowing him, gave a magnificent masquerade at his house of Merino, some few miles from Dublin, on the Dunleary Road, and it was at this entertainment that I was determined that Ulick should be made happy for life. Miss Kiljoy was invited to the masquerade, and the little Lord Bullingdon, who longed to witness such a scene, and it was agreed that he was to go under the guardianship of his governor, my old friend, the Reverend Mr. Runt. I learned what was the equipage in which the party were to be conveyed to the ball, and took my measures accordingly. Ulick Brady was not present. 
his fortune and quality were not sufficient to procure him an invitation to so distinguished a place, and I had it given out three days previous that he had been arrested for a debt, a rumor which surprised nobody who knew him. I appeared that night in a character with which I was very familiar, that of a private soldier in the King of Prussia's guard. I had a grotesque mask made, with an immense nose and moustaches, talked a jumble of broken English and German, in which the latter greatly predominated, and had crowds round me laughing at my droll accent, and whose curiosity was increased by a knowledge of my previous history. Miss Kiljoy was attired as an antique princess, with little Bullingdon as a page of the times of chivalry. His hair was in powder, his doublet rose-color, and pea-green and silver, and he looked very handsome and saucy as he strutted about with my sword by his side. As for Mr. Runt, he walked about very demurely in a domino, and perpetually paid his respects to the buffet, and ate enough cold chicken and drank enough punch and champagne to satisfy a company of grenadiers. The Lord Lieutenant came and went in state. The ball was magnificent. Miss Kiljoy had partners in plenty, among whom was myself, who walked a minuet with her, if the clumsy waddling of the Irish heiress may be called by such a name, and I took occasion to plead my passion for Lady Linden in the most pathetic terms, and to beg her friend's interference in my favour. It was three hours past midnight when the party for Linden House went away. Little Bullingdon had long since been asleep in one of Lady Charlemont's china closets. Mr. Runt was exceedingly husky in talk, and unsteady in gait. A young lady of the present day would be alarmed to see a gentleman in such a condition, but it was a common sight in those jolly old times, when a gentleman was thought a milksop, unless he was occasionally tipsy. I saw Miss Kiljoy to her carriage, with several other gentlemen, and, peering through the crowd of ragged link-boys, drivers, beggars, drunken men and women, who used invariably to wait round great men's doors when festivities were going on, saw the carriage drive off with a hurrah from the mob. Then came back presently to the supper-room, where I talked German, favoured the three or four topers still there with a high Dutch chorus, and attacked the dishes and wine with great resolution. "'How can you drink Ainsy with that big nose on?' said one gentleman. "'Go and be hanked,' said I, in the true accent, applying myself again to the wine, with which the others laughed, and I pursued my supper in silence. There was a gentleman present who had seen the Linden party go off, with whom I had made a bet, which I lost, and the next morning I called upon him and paid at him. All which particulars the reader will be surprised at hearing enumerated, but the fact is that it was not I who went back to the party, but my late German valet, who was of my size, and, dressed in my mask, could perfectly pass for me. We changed clothes in a hackney coach that stood near Lady Linden's chariot, and, driving after it, speedily overtook it. The fated vehicle which bore the lovely object of Ulick Brady's affections had not advanced very far, when, in the midst of a deep rut in the road, it came suddenly to with a jolt. The footman, springing off the back, cried, Stop! to the coachman, warning him that a wheel was off, and that it would be dangerous to proceed with only three. Wheel caps had not been invented in those days, as they have since been by the ingenious builders of Longacre. And how the linchpin of the wheel had come out I do not pretend to say. But it possibly may have been extracted by some rogues among the crowd before Lord Charlemont's gate. Miss Kiljoy thrust her head out of the window, screaming as ladies do. Mr. Runt, the chaplain, woke up from his boozy slumbers, and little Bullingdon, staring up and drawing his little sword, said, Don't be afraid, Miss Amelia. If it's footpads, I am armed. The young rascal had the spirit of a lion, that's the truth, 
as I must acknowledge in spite of all my after quarrels with him. The hackney coach which had been following Lady Linden's chariot by this time came up, and the coachman, seeing the disaster, stepped down from the box and politely requested her ladyship's honour to enter his vehicle, which was as clean and elegant as any person of tip-top quality might desire. The invitation was, after a minute or two, accepted by the passengers of the chariot, the hackney coachman promising to drive them to Dublin, in a hurry. Thady, the valet, proposed to accompany his young master and the young lady, and the coachman, who had a friend seemingly drunk by his side on the box, with a grin told Thady to get up behind. However, as the footboard there was covered with spikes, as a defence against the street boys, who love a ride gratis, Thady's fidelity would not induce him to brave these, and he was persuaded to remain by the wounded chariot, for which he and the coachman manufactured a linchpin out of a neighbouring hedge. Meanwhile, although the hackney coachman drove on rapidly, yet the party within seemed to consider it was a long distance from Dublin. And what was Miss Kiljoy's astonishment, on looking out of the window at length, to see around her a lonely heath, with no signs of buildings or city. She began forthwith to scream out to the coachman to stop, but the man only whipped the horses the faster for her noise, and bade her ladyship, Hold on, t'was a short cut he was taking. Miss Kiljoy continued screaming, the coachman flogging, the horses galloping, until two or three men appeared suddenly from a hedge, to whom the fair one cried for assistance, and the young Bullingdon, opening the coach-door, jumped valiantly out, toppling over head and heels as he fell. But, jumping up in an instant, he drew his little sword, and, running towards the carriage, exclaimed, "'This way, gentlemen! Stop the rascal!' "'Stop!' cried the men, at which the coachman pulled up with extraordinary obedience. Runt, all the while, lay tipsy in the carriage, having only a dreamy half-consciousness of all that was going on. The newly arrived champions of female distress now held a consultation, in which they looked at the young lord and laughed considerably. "'Do not be alarmed,' said the leader, coming up to the door. "'One of my people shall mount the box by the side of that treacherous rascal, and, with your ladyship's leave, I and my companions will get in and see you home.' We're well armed, and can defend you in case of danger. With this, and without more ado, he jumped into the carriage, his companion following him. "'Know your place, fellow,' cried out little Bullingdon indignantly, "'and give place to the Lord Viscount Bullingdon,' and put himself before the huge person of the newcomer, who was about to enter the hackney coach. "'Get out of that, my lord,' said the man, in a broad brogue and shoving him aside, on which the boy, crying, "'Thieves! Thieves!' drew out his little hanger and ran at the man, as would have wounded him, for a small sword will wound as well as a great one. But his opponent, who was armed with a long stick, struck the weapon luckily out of the lad's hands. It went flying over his head and left him aghast and mortified at his discomfiture. He then pulled off his hat, making his lordship a low bow, and entered the carriage, the door of which was shut upon him by his confederate who was to mount the box. Miss Kiljoy might have screamed, but I presume her shrieks were stopped by the sight of an enormous horse-pistol which one of her champions produced, and who said, "'No harm is intended you, ma'am, but if you cry out we must gag you,' on which she suddenly became as mute as a fish." All these events took place in an exceedingly short space of time, and when the three invaders had taken possession of the carriage, the poor little Bullingdon being left bewildered and astonished on the heath, one of them, putting his head out of the window, said, "'My lord, a word with you.' "'What is it?' said the boy, beginning to whimper. He was but eleven years old, and his courage had been excellent hitherto." You are only two miles from Marino. Walk back till you come to a big stone. There turn to the right, 
and keep on straight till you get to the high road, when you will easily find your way back. And when you see her ladyship your mamma, give Captain Thunder's compliments, and say Miss Amelia Kiljoy is going to be married. Oh, heavens! sighed out that young lady. The carriage drove swiftly on, and the poor little nobleman was left alone on the heath, just as the morning was beginning to break. He was fairly frightened, and no wonder. He thought of running after the coach, but his courage and his little legs failed him, so he sat down upon a stone and cried for vexation. It was in this way that Ulick Brady made what I call a Sabine marriage. When he halted with his two groomsmen at the cottage where the ceremony was to be performed, Mr. Runt, the chaplain, at first declined to perform it. But a pistol was held at the head of that unfortunate preceptor, and he was told with dreadful oaths that his miserable brains would be blown out when he consented to read the service. The lovely Amelia had, very likely, a similar inducement held out to her, but of that I know nothing, for I drove back to town with the coachman as soon as we had set the bridal party down, and had the satisfaction of finding Fritz, my German, arrived before me. He had come back in my carriage in my dress, having left the masquerade undiscovered, and done everything there according to my orders. Poor Runt came back the next day in a piteous plight, keeping silence as to his share in the occurrences of the evening, and with a dismal story of having been drunk, of having been waylaid and bound, of having been left on the road and picked up by a Wicklow cart, which was coming in with provisions to Dublin, and found him helpless on the road. There was no possible means of fixing any share of the conspiracy upon him. Little Bullingdon, who, too, found his way home, was unable in any way to identify me. But Lady Lyndon knew that I was concerned in the plot, for I met her hurrying the next day to the castle, all the town being up about the enlèvement. And I saluted her with a smile so diabolical that I knew she was aware that I had been concerned in the daring and ingenious scheme. Thus it was that I repaid Ulick Brady's kindness to me in early days and had the satisfaction of restoring the fallen fortunes of a deserving branch of my family. He took his bride into Wicklow, where he lived with her in the strictest seclusion until the affair was blown over, the Killjoys striving everywhere in vain to discover his retreat. They did not for a while even know who was the lucky man who had carried off the heiress, nor was it until she wrote a letter some week afterwards, signed Amelia Brady, and expressing perfect happiness in her new condition, and stating that she had been married by Lady Lyndon's chaplain, Mr. Runt, that the truth was known, and my worthy friend confessed his share of the transaction. As his good-natured mistress did not dismiss him from his post in consequence, everybody persisted in supposing that poor Lady Lyndon was privy to the plot, and the story of her ladyship's passionate attachment for me gained more and more credit. I was not slow, you may be sure, in profiting by these rumors. Everyone thought I had a share in the Brady marriage, though no one could prove it. Everyone thought I was well with the widowed countess, though no one could show that I said so. But there is a way of proving a thing even while you contradict it, and I used to laugh and joke so apropos that all men began to wish me joy of my great fortune and look up to me as the affianced husband of the greatest heiress in the kingdom. The papers took up the matter. The female friends of Lady Lyndon remonstrated with her and cried, Fie! Even the English journals and magazines, which in those days were very scandalous, talked of the matter, and whispered that a beautiful and accomplished widow, with a title and the largest possessions in the two kingdoms, was about to bestow her hand upon a young gentleman of high birth, and fashion, who had distinguished himself in the service of his M blank 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 Y, the K blank of Pr blank. I won't say who was the author of these paragraphs, or how two pictures, one representing myself under the title of the Prussian Irishman, 
and the other Lady Linden as the Countess of Ephesus, actually appeared in the Town and Country magazine, published at London, and containing the fashionable tittle-tattle of the day. Lady Linden was so perplexed and terrified by this continual hold upon her, that she determined to leave the country. Well, she did. And who was the first to receive her on landing at Hollyhead? Your humble servant, Redmond Berry, Esquire. And to crown all, the Dublin Mercury, which announced her ladyship's departure, announced mine the day before. There was not a soul but thought she had followed me to England, whereas she was only flying me. Vain hope! A man of my resolution was not thus to be balked in pursuit. Had she fled to the Antipodes, I would have been there. I and would have followed her as far as Orpheus did Eurydice. Her ladyship had a house in Berkeley Square, London, more splendid than that which she possessed in Dublin. And knowing that she would come thither, I preceded her to the English capital, and took handsome apartments in Hill Street, hard by. I had the same intelligence in her London house which I had procured in Dublin. The same faithful porter was there to give me all the information I required. I promised to treble his wages as soon as a certain event should happen. I won over Lady Linden's companion by a present of a hundred guineas down, and a promise of two thousand when I should be married, and gained the favours of her favourite lady's maid by a bribe of similar magnitude. My reputation had so far preceded me in London that, on my arrival, numbers of the genteel were eager to receive me at their routes. We have no idea in this humdrum age what a gay and splendid place London was then, what a passion for play there was among young and old, male and female, what thousands were lost and won in a night, what beauties there were, how brilliant, gay, and dashing. Everybody was delightfully wicked. The royal dukes of Gloucester and Cumberland set the example, and nobles followed close behind. Running away was the fashion. Ah, it was a pleasant time, and lucky was he who had fire and youth and money and could live in it. I had all these, and the old frequenters of whites, watiers, and goose-trees could tell stories of the gallantry, spirit, and high fashion of Captain Barry. The progress of a love story is tedious to all those who are not concerned, and I leave such themes to the hack novel writers and the young boarding-school misses for whom they write. It is not my intention to follow, step by step, the incidents of my courtship, or to narrate all the difficulties I had to contend with and my triumphant manner of surmounting them. Suffice it to say, I did overcome these difficulties. I am of the opinion, with my friend the late ingenious Mr. Wilkes, that such impediments are nothing in the way of a man of spirit, and that he can convert indifference and aversion into love, if he have perseverance and cleverness sufficient. By the time the Countess's widowhood was expired, I had found means to be received into her house. I had her women perpetually talking in my favour, vaunting my powers, expatiating upon my reputation, and boasting of my success and popularity in the fashionable world. Also, the best friends I had in the prosecution of my tender suit were the Countess's noble relatives, who were far from knowing the service that they did me, and to whom I beg leave to tender my heartfelt thanks for the abuse which they then loaded me, and to whom I fling my utter contempt for the calumny and hatred with which they have subsequently pursued me. The chief of these amiable persons was the Marchioness of Tiptoff, mother of the young gentleman whose audacity I had punished at Dublin. This old harridan, on the Countess's first arrival in London, waited upon her, and favoured her with such a storm of abuse for her encouragement of me, 
that i do believe she advanced my cause more than six months courtship could have done or the pinking of a half dozen of rivals it was in vain that poor lady linden pleaded her entire innocence and vowed she had never encouraged me never encouraged him screamed out the old fury didn't you encourage the wretch at spa during sir charles's own life didn't you marry a dependent of yours to one of this profligate's bankrupt cousins when he set off for england didn't you follow him like a madwoman the very next day didn't he take lodgings at your very door almost and do you call this no encouragement for shame madam shame you might have married my son my dear and noble george but that he did not choose to interfere with your shameful passion for the beggarly upstart whom you caused to assassinate him and the only counsel i have to give your ladyship is this to legitimize the ties which you have contracted with this shameless adventurer to make that connection legal which real as it is now is against both decency and religion and to spare your family and your son the shame of your present line of life with this the old fury of a marchioness left the room and lady linden in tears i had the whole particulars of the conversation from her ladyship's companion and augured the best result from it in my favour thus by the sage influence of my lady tiptoff the countess of linden's natural friends and family were kept from her society even when lady linden went to court the most august lady in the realm received her with such marked coldness that the unfortunate widow came home and took to her bed with vexation and thus i may say that royalty itself became an agent in advancing my suit and helping the plans of the poor irish soldier of fortune so is it that fate works with agents great and small and by means over which they have no control the destinies of men and women are accomplished i shall always consider the conduct of mrs bridget lady linden's favourite maid at this juncture as a masterpiece of ingenuity and indeed had such an opinion of her diplomatic skill that the very instant i became master of the linden estates and paid her the promised sum i am a man of honour and rather than not keep my word with the woman i raised the money of the jews at an exorbitant interest as soon i say as i achieved my triumph i took mrs bridget by the hand and said madam you have shown such unexampled fidelity in my service that i am glad to reward you according to my promise but you have given proofs of such extraordinary cleverness and dissimulation that i must decline keeping you in lady linden's establishment and beg you will leave it this very day which she did and went over to the tiptoff faction and has abused me ever since but i must tell you what she did which was so clever why it was the simplest thing in the world as all master strokes are when lady linden lamented her fate and my as she was pleased to call it shameful treatment of her mrs bridget said why should not your ladyship write this young gentleman word of the evil which he is causing you appeal to his feelings which i have heard say are very good indeed the whole town is ringing with accounts of his spirit and generosity and beg him to desist from a pursuit which causes the best of ladies so much pain do do my lady write i know your style is so elegant that i for my part have many a time burst into tears in reading your charming letters and i have no doubt mr barry will sacrifice anything rather than hurt your feelings and of course the abigail swore to the fact do you think so bridget said her ladyship and my mistress forthwith penned me a letter in her most fascinating and winning manner why sir wrote she will you pursue me why environ me in a web of intrigue so frightful that my spirit sinks under it 
seeing escape is hopeless from your frightful your diabolical art they say you are generous to others be so to me i know your bravery but too well exercise it on men who can meet your sword not on a poor feeble woman who cannot resist you remember the friendship you once professed for me and now i beseech you i implore you to give a proof of it contradict the calumnies which you have spread against me and repair if you can and if you have a spark of honour left the miseries which you have caused to the heart-broken h linden what was this letter meant for but that i should answer it in person my excellent ally told me where i should meet lady linden and accordingly i followed and found her at the pantheon i repeated the scene at dublin over again showed her how prodigious my power was humble as i was and that my energy was still untired but i added i am as great in good as i am in evil as fond and faithful as a friend as i am terrible as an enemy i will do everything i said which you ask of me except when you bid me not to love you that is beyond my power and while my heart has a pulse i must follow you it is my fate your fate cease to battle against it and be mine loveliest of your sex with life alone can end my passion for you and indeed it is only by dying at your command that i can be brought to obey you do you wish me to die she said laughing for she was a woman of a lively humorous turn that she did not wish me to commit self-murder and i felt from that moment that she was mine a year from that day on the fifteenth of may in the year seventeen seventy three i had the honour and happiness to lead to the altar honoria countess of linden widow of the late right honourable sir charles linden k b the ceremony was performed at st george's hanover square by the rev samuel runt her ladyship's chaplain a magnificent supper and ball was given at our house in berkeley square and the next morning i had a duke four earls three generals and a crowd of the most distinguished people in london at my levee walpole made a lampoon about the marriage and selwyn cut jokes at the cocoa tree old lady tiptoff although she had recommended it was ready to bite off her fingers with vexation and as for young bullingdon who was grown a tall lad of fourteen when called upon by the countess to embrace his papa he shook his fist in my face and said he my father i would as soon call one of your ladyship's footmen papa but i could afford to laugh at the rage of the boy and the old woman and at the jokes of the wits of st james's i sent off a flaming account of our nuptials to my mother and my uncle the good chevalier and now arrived at the pitch of prosperity and having at thirty years of age by my own merits and energy raised myself to one of the highest social positions that any man in england could occupy i determined to enjoy myself as became a man of quality for the remainder of my life after we had received the congratulations of our friends in london for in those days people were not ashamed of being married as they seem to be now i and honoria who was all complacency and a most handsome sprightly and agreeable companion set off to visit our estates in the west of england where i had never as yet set foot we left london in three chariots each with four horses and my uncle would have been pleased could he have seen painted on their panels the irish crown and the ancient coat of the berries beside the countess's coronet and the noble cognizance of the noble family of linden before quitting london i procured his majesty's gracious permission to add the name of my lovely lady to my own and henceforward assumed the style and title 
of Barry Lyndon, as I have written it in this autobiography. End of chapter 16